So welcome back, everybody. Time once again for another Health Talks with Dr. Trin. The one show, the only show to show you a path towards a healthier life. One conversation at a time. And today, well, I guess we need it more than ever because, uh, boy, we're in the middle of COVID resurgence and RSV and flu and the cold that I got here today, Dr. Trin. What do you think? Is it time for a healthy talk here? Absolutely. We're, we're in the middle of some kind of triple pandemic. We got COVID in the hospital, we have the flu, and we have RSV. So I've been in the hospital, you know, pretty much every every week uh, in the ER admitting patients. And we're out of like beds in most of our hospitals. We're using the ER as inpatient care now. And and the waiting rooms at many of these hospitals where patients normally wait in the ER right. have been converted to like hospital rooms as well. It's crazy. Crazy. Somebody I know was in a ER, a friend of a friend for something other than one of those three. And they literally had to sit in the hallway. They put them on a gurney in the hallway. There's oh, no yeah. beds. That's normal. That's a normal thing. The hallways are filled now. It's Yeah, soon we'll be seeing patients in the parking lot i'm yeah, sure i think it's so, like right. the next trio center <laughs> so in the midst of all this we're back again to talk about cannabinoids and treating it not just as an anecdotal story but to get some real data and some real research again here and i think you got some great people to talk about that here today absolutely welcome dr chris emerson from uh, level and welcome tyler our buddy from uh well i know the relief app and more better is that right correct maybe we'll go do a little round of introductions first and have you guys introduce yourself your background and your organization before we take a deeper dive with that tyler want to chat first yeah sure thanks for having us first off and yeah tyler dowtrick uh, i am the coo at more better as you mentioned earlier we're kind of most widely known for the relief app specifically in the cannabinoid space Essentially, we're a, a software data and research company. We've developed two different tools that are wrapped around collecting real-world data on product use and efficacy. So we can focus on specific product use and specific performance of those products. The goal there being advanced science, advanced research, help patients and consumers make better decisions and get better data insights back to brands like Level. And that's one of the reasons that we're on here with Level today is collaborative research effort between More Better Level, University of Michigan, and your group, Dr. Trim, PCC. And I got to say real quickly, go blue. I went to the University <laughs> of Michigan. We talked about this last week when you guys came on and talked about the work you do and the app. What I call you really do is you're giving people power to track their own usage of cannabinoids. So it's almost like your own self-study, your own data oh, collection here. And because too many of us, which we talked about before, just to frame the issue, and I'll let you guys launch here and shut up with my cold here. But it really is that. It's, it's anecdotal. How much should I take? What should I do? So I experiment. I try a little bit. I try this. Nobody really knows how much, how often, everything else like this. And you're trying to come up with some more baselines and some more data and information that, that consumers can use and that maybe companies can use too. And understanding how people use their product. So I know that Chris is a continuation of that conversation that we had last week. So I'll let you guys jump in. Why don't you introduce yourself, Chris? Thank you all for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Chris Emerson, I'm the founder and CEO of Level. We are a cannabinoid research and development company, but we actually productize and commercialize products. So we're operating in California, Nevada right now under the regulated space in cannabis. I have a PhD in small molecule chemistry, did a postdoc at Stanford. Big Pharma wasn't my path and I didn't want to go into academics. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I never really understood how I was going to be able to reconcile hard science and, you know, starting a company. You just really can't start a chemical company in a garage anymore. <laughs> um, and just through a series of serendipitous events in early 2012, I got into the cannabis industry and then spent several years trying to launch a couple companies that were wonderful failures. And in 2015, I founded Level on the thesis around effects-based or targeted effects from cannabis, right? So most people, they think cannabis, 
if they're only an occasional user or they haven't used it in a while, usually you hear from people, well, it made me really paranoid. It made me tired or it made me hungry. And I didn't find any interest in that. Stigma aside from all the cultural stigma from the past 85 years, but the effect that people had from it wasn't something that was intriguing or enticing enough for them to try it again. But, you know, the cannabis plant has a multitude of, of components outside of cannabinoids, but cannabinoids alone, there's over, you know, there's a hundred plus cannabinoids that we really know very little about. If they discovered cannabis in the Amazon today, it would be hailed as, as a miracle plant, right? And Machulam is very famous for, for pushing on that. And that's, I really identified with that. And that became the thesis of the company, right? Can we get to new targets and new effects from cannabis that people wouldn't expect? that isn't necessarily centered around psychoactivity. We know that there's there's a lot of need for that and people enjoy it. So we should al- provide for that as well. But there's a whole host of other things. And we'll talk about this a little bit r- later on in, in the emergent cannabinoids. The potential for therapeutics and the impact it could have on human health is, is pretty substantial. And so that's really the driving thesis for the company and how we formulate, why we formulate and what we're trying to push forward. Yeah. What do you mean when you say effects-based cannabis? What does that mean? It's a great question. So we would say, you know, whether it's an evocative name or maybe a mood state, but instead of just traditionally in cannabis, canonically, you would have a sativa, a hybrid, or an indica. And and there's a lot of confusion in that because people would say, well, are you talking about the genetics of the plant or are you talking about the effect you would get from consuming a sativa or an indica? And so... The genetics argument aside, we would look at sativa or indica as two effect types where a sativa is supposed to be uplifting, give you creativity, give you a different feeling than say an indica, which tends to be more chill, a heavier body load, maybe slightly less psychoactivity or the perception of, but those are really big, big, broad buckets. What we want to be able to do is like, do you want focus? Do you want energy or do you want relaxation, but without psychoactivity? different use cases so you can use cannabis products with psychoactivity or without but that actually deliver on what they say they're going to do so if we say hey this product will help you with focus it could be a coffee replacement in your afternoon but the person ends up going to sleep well we failed them and we're not actually delivering on the effect and so you have to define to- those terms for us you threw out some terms both of you i've never heard before syndicate or something i don't know whatever you just rattled off a couple of different terms or i don't know what those mean so sativas as an effect tend to be uplifting or energizing with but what's a sativa i don't know what that means i mean that's a great question yeah. we're, we're taking this down to like the general public here yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. so is what it, is sativa what is indica what is that yeah for the general public who's never heard of it. so the terms arise from more of like how the genetics and the expression of the plant are so okay Fundamentally, sativa plants, and this this is back before there was so much crossbreeding and hybridization in the industry. Sativa plants tended to be very long in their flower time. Okay. Take months to flower. They're very tall. They tend to have very thin leaflets. Uh, They're not heavy producers of the plant. But the cannabis that you could harvest from a sativa type plant had a different effect than, say, an indica. Mm. Now, an indica plant would be shorter, typically bushier, broader leaflets, and tend to be heavier producers of cannabis. Mm. And now, if you were to take flour from a sativa plant and combust it and smoke it, the effect you would get is different than what you would get from an indica. I see. And so, so, they're, so they're, they're under the cannabis umbrella, but there are two categories of cannabis or marijuana plants. Does that make sense? Oh, there are two different categories under the same plant. One is sativa, the other one's indica. I didn't know there were different categories. I think most <laughs> of us think cannabis, pot, yeah. marijuana, whatever you want to call it, is a plant, like a tomato plant. And I guess there are millions of types of tomatoes. There's heirloom tomatoes and all these other things. But generally, we tend to think of a tomato as a plant, and there's not a lot of variation in it, although I know that's wrong. So you're saying there's a lot of variation in cannabis plants, marijuana plants, and those variations, those genetic botanical variations cause yes. different reactions or responses or have more of this compound, this cannabinoid, and less of that compound. Is that right? Yes, and it leads to a different effect. And that's a great, you know, I love that you brought up. First off, thanks for slowing me down and helping me understand. Yeah, I mean, you guys are rattling away. I'm like, what? Yeah, am no. I the only one that doesn't know what any of this means here? Yeah. The analogy to tomato is interesting, and it's a good one. I think another way to look at it, too, is tea. 
if you were to think of tea of having black tea versus say a green tea or a white tea, you would have a very, you know, a lot of people, black tea, you get slightly energized and you're ready to go. That would be more like a sativa. And -hmm. then if you were to have a white tea or a green tea with no caffeine, that would potentially more like an indica. It relaxes you a little sedating, if you will, and to chill you out. And then, you know, the tea plants will look differently amongst themselves. And so I think you can use that to envision the difference between, say, a sativa and an indica. Let me ask you one more question. I keep saying I'm not going to talk, but now you got me interested here. <laughs> Years ago, we had somebody on talking sort of about this. I don't remember those terms. But they said that one of the, either the good news or the bad news about the cannabis plant in general is that it's kind of a wild weed almost. And so the variations are almost endless. Its adaptation is enormous. It doesn't, it's not a touchy plant to grow. It grows anywhere like a weed and therefore it takes on different shapes and characteristics and whatnot. And one of the challenges the industry's had is trying to take this wild sort of weed with lots of strains and variation and get it genetically down to a few producible crops that they can predictably grow over and over and over and over again. Is that true or am I overemphasizing the chaotic nature of this plant here? A lot of what you say, there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. Look, humans have been co-evolving with this plant for at least the duration of recorded history and probably for a lot, lot longer than that. So at a minimum 10,000 years, but let's just say it's probably a safe assumption that much longer than that, that humans and this plant have co-evolved together. And the plant is very hardy, so it can grow in a lot of different conditions. Sativas land race, which are, you know, plants that are grown without any genetic mutation because there's been crossbreeding. These plants have grown in different areas and geographies of the world. And so what's happened, though, through this co-evolution, though, is now, you know, get to things like in the 1930s with the marijuana tax, then now it becomes a prohibited compound, you know, cannabis itself, and it goes underground. And now you have people breeding for it. And now they're selectively breeding for one thing, and that is high, that is for THC. And so now we put it through this 85 year genetic program where nobody's tracking any of the genetics or what they're crossing. And all of a sudden you have this massive amount of hybridization. So whereas before we had these two, you know, these two really distinct, beautiful genotypes and phenotype and multiples of phenotypes from these two types of plants, now it's a big mix and wash. And to your point, now we're trying to to build out of that again. Can we get some more distinct, unique strains that aren't just a wash in randomness. And last question about this. So am I understanding that in the beginning, we didn't think there was anything in the in this plant except THC. That was the only thing that was of value. That was the only thing they bred for. And so the more THC, Maui Wowie or something, the more THC you could get, the wow or the was, the better. Nobody cared about any other compounds. They didn't understand it. It was only in recent history, relatively recent, mm-hmm. like decade or something here, that yeah. we suddenly began to realize there are lots of cannabinoids, lots of compounds other than THC, and now you've identified a hundred plus of these things, and we don't know what they do. Maybe they don't do anything for us, or maybe they have all sorts of other therapeutic benefits and value that we're just beginning to understand and study and research, because all we ever did was want to get high off of marijuana for most people, and that's what they bred for. So that's a great segue, because we want to talk about the emergent cannabinoids. Right and how you know they're being studied and how we're using them in products now. What are some of the popular emergent cannabinoids outside of CBD that you're looking at? Yeah, and thank you for that, for highlighting CBD for sure. CBG, cannabigerol, is getting very popular. It's similar to CBD. And when you discuss cannabis and cannabinoids, I think people tend to think that it might be a one-size-fits-all, but it, it's very complex. There's a lot of science that goes behind it. And so trying to distill it down into simple terms can be confusing at times. I'm going to take a step just back really quick because it it might help people understand better kind of the power and amazingness of this plant is the plant produces a compound. I'm going to talk in neutral terms. So it produces CBG, which is a compound. And then it takes that and it sends it through the biochemical machinery that it has. And it takes one compound and it folds it or changes it into three other ones. And from that, you get THC. Mm -hmm. which most people are very familiar with. That's what gets you high. You get CBD, Mm -hmm. and then you get a much less known compound called CBC. The plant takes this one compound, it converts it into potentially three other compounds. And then from those three other compounds, it's a cascade. That's where you get up to a hundred other compounds. And so 
it's this conservation of in the stinginess of nature, if you will, of really trying to take similar compounds to slightly modify them. So the THC, as you said, CBD is not considered an emergent cannabinoid anymore. We've got CBG, which is kind of like the progenitor of all the other cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. Think of it as like the stem cell of all other cannabinoids. Yeah. Okay. The really popular one out now is CBN, and CBN is derived from THC. So it is a byproduct. It's converted from THC into this other molecule called cannabinol. Yeah. And this one is very popular because empirically it's known to be a little more sedating. It may help with sleep. Or it may help promote with sleep, especially in combination with, with other cannabinoids. Okay. And then I think the other emergent cannabinoid that people will start seeing here is THCB, and that's tetrahydrocannabivarin. And this one is a little bit different. It's been shown to potentially be an appetite suppressant and to help really? modulate, yeah, okay. and to help modulate food intake and also for focus and energy. So it's, it's almost a stimulant. Which, when you tell people that the cannabis plant produces a stimulant as a cannabinoid, they don't want to believe you because they're like, uh, stoners are lazy, they're not motivated, and they just sit on the couch, and they're like, actually, so this that's is, not the truth. So this is THCV? Correct. So you're looking at it as an appetite suppressant and focus on energy. Does it make you high or not really? The THCV? Yes. All the cannabinoids have their psychoactivity associated with them. Now, we all associate yes. cannabis with the high of THC. They're all nuanced and they're slightly different. So let me ask you this. Do you feel high when you have coffee, Dr. Trin? Yeah, I feel more awake. Yeah, I feel more awake, more alert. So it depends on how you define high, I guess, right? Right. Yeah, I don't get stoned, but I'm wired. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a, So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're all psychoactive in some way mm -hmm. with that. Whether it's sedating or whether, it, you know, it, the term psychoactive has always been delegated to THC, but the truth is CBD makes you psychoactive in a different way. Mm -hmm. It's a generic term, right, with that. So absolutely right. Yes. <laughs> so similar to the whole conversation around sativa and indica, how we discuss and talk about the different states, physiological states and psychoactive states from cannabis and cannabinoids, this is all burgeoning as well, right? We're having to create the lexicon of how we're going to describe these things to a population that is still, most people don't even know CBD. There's a difference between THC and CBD, and we are, we are yep. just at the starting blocks at the moment. So I would say, yes, there's a physiological change. So there is psychoactivity with those compounds, CBN, THCV, but they're very nuanced compared to, say, THC. Well, let me, yeah. let, let me piggyback off of that, Chris, because there's two products of yours that, you know, we kind of just talked about that. It'd be interesting to get your take on just based on these emergent cannabinoids. One, I know you have a CBG product that's pretty heavily dominant in just CBG, correct? correct. Yeah. So I guess two questions. One, what feedback are you getting on the use of that? Or what was the kind of thought process and internal research and discovery that went behind that, given that it is an emergent cannabinoid and now you have like a whole product designated to it? And then the second question would be related to this particular study that we're doing together. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the products you have in the study is THCB. Is that right? Or it has the one of the tablets has THCB in it? No, not for the Michigan study. THCA? Yeah, it has. Yes, it has the acidic and my and alphabetic soup mixed up. Yeah. There. And that's something I will, because they are, I still consider the acidic cannabinoids to be emergent. I can address that in a second. Yeah, the CBG is a very interesting molecule. And because of the thesis of the company and how we went about it, and the primary the primary form factors that we develop and productize at the company are tablets, both sublingual and orally administered. So you can, you know, we have some you dissolve in your mouth. We have other ones that you're intended to swallow whole, right? So there's different onset times. We can use different dosages for those, and they have different durations. Mm -hmm. When we started working with a lot of the emergent cannabinoids seven years ago, they were very, very hard to source. They were very expensive. And so you needed a form factor that would allow you to still be able to put them on the market, let the consumers and patients try them to see if they were having a positive response from that given cannabinoid. And it also gave us an opportunity to really start understanding what kind of effects we would expect from them. A, not only in isolation, but then as we would use those in other formulations for targeting these effects that we wanted to go after, such as focus, energy, or sleep. What are you hearing from the consumer with CBG? For a lot of the people who use it, 
a lot of the empirical reports we're getting is that it really helps provide a calmness. So it kind of takes the edge off of everything. It's a de-stressor. And even less so than CBD, people don't really report a change in their, their physiological response. What they just notice is like, oh my goodness, I was at a 10 and now I'm at an eight. So I can actually go deal with my life. That's what a lot of the reports we get are. And I don't have a better way to explain either, but it seems when you use CBG in small amounts, so smaller ratios, smaller single digit percentages in products, it helps round out the entire cannabinoid profile and really enhances the experience. And so we use CBG in all of our products, you know, in, mostly in smaller amounts, but we do have a, a CBG isolate that we use for a, a 25 milligram dosage. This is one of those circumstances where less is more. Yeah, mm -hmm. just to yeah. feedback off of that too, like that's so the data that we've collected so far in CBG kind of supports exactly what Chris just said. So we actually did like a 30 day consumer type study with somewhere between 50 to 100 people where they used a tincture that was a CBG and then full spectrum CBD tincture. And mm -hmm. the whole focus was around like mild to temporary anxiety and just helping you calm mm -hmm. down. And we looked at a pretty standard like quality of life assessment score, a pretty standard like anxiety assessment score, and then ask just more self-reported measures on like how, you know, how do you feel it impacted your quality of life, your calmness levels, and just your day to day. And we actually saw that from a quality of life measurement, the scores went up two to four points on average across all participants. We saw the anxiety scores decrease like one to three points on average across all participants. And then pretty drastically from like a 75 to a 95% people agreeing with just overall quality of life improvement, feeling more calm and relaxed throughout the two or three week span of using the product, which was interesting because before we did that, we weren't really kind of opposite of what Chris was saying. Like we weren't really hearing that CBG was something for like anxiety or anything. Like what we started to hear, it was like inflammation and a stronger version of CBD to help with your pain and things like that. And then, you know, we started to get whispers of like, oh, maybe it can help you relax. And then, yeah, we did this 30-day study and we're kind of surprised with the results that came back from that. This is the yeah. value of doing these studies. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it really is. And then, I mean, we, we did a fully decentralized observational study that we, that we finished about three months ago using CBG to see if it had an impact on sleep in a veteran's population. Mm -hmm. It was patient reported outcomes. So right. they were doing that, but we also tracked them with Fitbits for six weeks. And so we had a two week period before the intervention. Then between weeks two and four, they took 25 milligrams of the study right. intervention. And then weeks four to six, they took 50 milligrams. And there wasn't a smoking gun for us. It wasn't like we found massive clinical significance across the entire population. But as we really dove into the data, we saw that there was a dose dependence in an older population where exactly what you were talking about, Tyler, where we were seeing reporting of, you know, reducing in anxiety or stress. So it is really interesting. And I think part of the challenge too, is that if you have a population that uses cannabis regularly, they notice it less than say populations that don't. Yeah. Lots of interesting things that need to be studied and teased out from this. Were you able to see any improvement in sleep with the Fitbit monitoring? I won't go into too much detail because we're finalizing the publication. However, it is, and it's one of the things we wanted to look at is what people are reporting as the outcome and what the data was actually saying, yeah. their biometric data was actually saying. And we, we definitely saw some orthogonal correlations for sure. Did you send Fitbits to these folks who volunteer? Have them we wear it. Love it. Love it. Collecting real life data there with that. So I can imagine now folks listening to our podcasts and folks in the future listening to our podcast, the first question they're going to ask is, where can I get this product that you're studying? Because I'm anxious and I want an improvement of, in my quality of life. Do you have a website or can you direct folks to who are interested in what we're talking about? Yeah, definitely. We're, you know, levelexperience.com is the website for the company. Because we operate in the regulated industry, there's nuance around this as well. Because we operate in the regulated industry in California, we can't ship a product, right? Yep. You have to go to a retailer, a licensed retailer in California. So if you go to our website, you can go to the product page and find the CBG ProTab and find mm -hmm. if it's sold near you. The interesting thing about CBG, though, it's protected under the Farm Bill, the 2018 Farm Bill. So there, as Tyler was saying, there's lots of companies that are making CBD and CBG products that they can ship across the country 
but level doesn't at this point. But can you ship within California? No, nope. it has okay, to be. So they have to go to the retailer. Yeah, or, or, or find a delivery California. service. Yeah, right. Yeah. Or find a delivery. Okay. Are you guys in Orange County? Do you have your products there? Level sold in over 600 retailers in California. So we have. So you're all over. Yeah. Good to know. That's very educational, guys, on just CBG and for folks who are trying to learn about all these new emerging cannabinoids. What about THCA? Tell us about that. Uh, THCA. Yeah, let, me, THCA. Let, me, let me put another oh. question in with this, too, because okay. like we just talked about anxiety. And the other big thing is just like pain. Everyone's looking for pain relief and everyone's looking to get away from pharmaceutical and over the counter pain relief and looking for yep. more natural therapeutic pain relief. And pain's obviously the topic of the study that we're doing with University of Michigan. And I think when everybody thinks of pain and cannabinoids, it's CBD. That's what the media pushes is like, take CBD, whether you rub it on a lotion, you have a pill, you eat a gummy, take a tincture, whatever, take CBD and your pain's going to just disappear. But, you know, Chris, one of the things I'm really interested to look at the results just myself from this study is you have some really unique formulations in the study when it comes to pain. And you can get in this, you have your CBD and THC ratio, but then this THCA product, it's just a really unique formulation that you choose to put into like a pain study. So again, just kind of curious on where you yeah. guys came up with that. Yeah, that's a great point, Tyler. And I do want to say just in general and for the audience, cannabis is not a silver bullet. There's no silver bullet in life, but I think a lot of people say, oh, cannabis, it's the panacea, it's going to solve everything. It doesn't. Cannabis is amazing because it takes the edge off, whether that's anxiety, whether that's sleep, whether that's pain. And so I think it's important for individuals who are going to use or who use cannabis to understand like, yeah, this isn't going to solve the problem. What cannabis is intended to do, as I think about it, is, is to help take the edge off so then we can then deal with what we need to in our life and make behavioral changes or make changes in diet or exercise or stress to help, to help us. So it helps facilitate our own journey, but it doesn't solve the problems. It can be very powerful in the facilitation, but it's not a cure. Yeah, for the University of Michigan, the pain study, I was really, I was really interested in trying to compare two products as much as we could to see the impact that it was going to have on pain. So one of the products is a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD. And this is a pretty classic ratio of those two cannabinoids. It happens in nature. There's plants that actually produce this exact ratio. And it's nice because the THC empirically, and there's some research out there, is pretty good for helping pain. But the CBD helps to mitigate or ameliorate the psychoactivity. So for people who might be a little more sensitive, it tends to be an easier kind of experience. And then the other product has acidic cannabinoids in them. And acidic cannabinoids, the plant produces everything. All the cannabinoids are produced in what's called the acidic form. And then when you extract the cannabinoids or you smoke flour or you put energy into a process for the cannabinoids, you drive off CO2 and it converts the molecule from what's called the acidic to a neutral cannabinoid. The interesting thing is, is that the acidic cannabinoids tend to have very little psychoactivity. So THCA does not have the same psychoactivity as THC. And from our experience and the very, almost no literature out there, but it, empirically THCA is shown to be very good at, as pain management. And so we wanted to do a, a formulation that was similar to the one-to-one -one of THC and CBD. So we have a, a, a THCA and a CBDA. So we went with the neutrals versus the acidic cannabinoids in an almost identical formulation to see, yeah, if there's any difference in the outcome for the patients. Interesting. That's cool. Very interesting. And this is part of the study with the uh, University of Michigan. Tell us more about the study. You're uh, enrolling, you're actively enrolling patients now with that. And specific for uh, California, is that right? Yeah, so it's California residents, yes. as Chris alluded to earlier. You know, it's hard to ship Chris's products outside of the state of California. Yes, yes. So yeah, California residents and chronic pain is a general umbrella. But then because chronic pain is such a general umbrella, we are targeting fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, and osteoarthritis of the knee or hip. And right. similar to how Chris mentioned with his CBG study, this is completely remote and decentralized. So the individuals don't have to travel to participate. We really wanted to focus on that observational real world data where we're just incorporating a new therapy into their day to day lives. And from a low barrier standpoint, getting as much feedback and data from them on how much of the product are you using? How often are you using it? And then sure, just generally, what are your 
perceptions on pain and quality of life. But then if we bake in these very specific questionnaires that are your standardized research criteria from a quality of life measurement, from a pain measurement, and from condition-specific measurements, what can we start to see in regards to therapeutic relief? But one of the interesting things to circle back to the beginning of the combo, and I think why Level is a company in general, is like the emergent cannabinoids in this effects-based cannabis. This isn't a study on is cannabis or CBD beneficial. It's a study on can we really start to identify trends when it comes to product formulation and dosing that leads to efficacy. Because with as much data and research that's out there on cannabinoid-based therapeutics right now, it's largely is cannabis or CBD beneficial. But like, you know, you walk into one of the 600 stores that levels in right now, and you're probably presented with hundreds to thousands of products to choose from. And they're all probably marketed as a, here's a sativa, here's an indica, and here's a hybrid. That's more or less the education that you get there. If I'm a RA, OA, fibro patient, I'm going to have very specific needs. And chances are I'm um, not the average 20 to 30 year old person who's like just looking to have a little buzz or looking to have a little hot, you know, like I got really chronic pain on a day-to-day basis that I'm looking to manage and help me get through. So like, what do I actually need to use from a formulation perspective? And like, how much do I actually need to use of it? And there's just really no data there right now. And that's really the emphasis behind this is If we can remove cannabis and CBD as like the intervention medicine, if we can remove indica, sativa, and hybrids as we classify products, and if we can really look at what these products are made of, what is the actual composition and formulation, and if we can look at a product form that's more or less controlled, like a tablet or a capsule, we can get pretty accurate dosing because it's, are you taking a half of a pill? Are you taking a whole pill? Like, you know, what are you taking? It's pretty simple to ask and get that data. And then can we start to see trends in regards to that type of regimen? Makes sense. Makes sense. You got to create some order in the wild, wild west. (laughs) And you guys are leading that charge, which is very impressive with that. So for the average folks who have not used these products, how do they enroll in this study that you have now? Is there a number? Is there a website? What do they do if they have arthritis, whether it's osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis or fibromyalgia, and they wanted to evaluate and and try out these products. Now, first of all, is it going to cost them anything Mm -hmm. charging for the products or not? And secondly, how do they enroll? What do they do? Yeah. So we'll answer the cost question because that's a a big question. And again, the the pleasures of dealing with the cannabis industry. So Chris can get more into this because he's an actual cannabis or California cannabis operator. So he has to deal with this more on an intricate level than I do. But essentially, you're not allowed to give away cannabis products for free in California. So because we don't want Chris's company in jeopardy, and I necessarily don't want to go to jail or have legal troubles with this, the study is set up in a way that on the front end, there is a $15 fee. That $15 fee keeps the study compliant, which is the most important. It covers 12 weeks supply of products. So there's no additional charge for products throughout the 12 weeks of the study. And it also has the product delivered right to your door. So again, you don't have to travel to participate. At the back end of the study, what we're doing for that 15 is we essentially have a reimbursement option. So for people who actually participate in the study and people who actually complete the study, on the last page of the study, there's a link that they can submit to get a reimbursement because if you're actually participating and completing the study, we don't want you to be charged. You know, Ideally, if we could have done it, the product would have been free. But also, I don't think any of us just want to give away free product and never hear from someone when we you know, have a specific study that we're trying to do. That's how we had to handle the loopholes, so to speak, with California law. And Chris, you can get into any of that in more detail if you if you want to. As far as finding the study, everything's online. The direct link to our site is relief, R-E-L-E-A-F dot at A-T and then slash U-M pain. So try to keep it as short as we can. Got it. Got it. Excellent. So $15 will get you three months of products delivered to your home. And the request for you, for the participant, is to give input on their symptoms, on their dosing, and I think, well, the dosing is pretty standard, right? Yeah, so it's essentially, you know, each yeah. product has like its recommendation from whether it's from Level or, or the other sponsor on, you know, this is how you should start and adjust accordingly for you. And Chris, you can get into that. It's text message too. So like we're doing this from, again, a very low barrier a low barrier, low friction standpoint. We're not really trying to make you go super out of your way, hence delivering the product to your home and all that stuff. 
So it's text messages to their phone. So they set the time every morning that a text message comes to them. They're telling us, hey, send me a text at this time. They get a text sent to their phone. They click a link. And most days, the questions are probably going to take them less than a minute to answer. The only time the questions are a little more intensive is on the monthly check-in. So week four, week eight, and week 12. And the reason for that is we're just asking more in-depth questions reflecting on the past month. So 99% of the questions are going to, again, come at the time of day you select or you determine, and it'll take you less than 60 seconds to answer. Wow. Truly decentralized, guys. Bravo. (laughs) That's what we're trying to do. I got to add one more comment as I've been listening to this and trying not to cough here. (laughs) A comment that you made at the beginning that you said so casually, and I think it bears calling it out, and that is drug companies are always scouring the jungles looking for a plant that has some magic property they can use that's been, maybe it's a plant that has been used in traditional medicine for thousands of years. And they're trying to see, does it really have any benefit to it? Oh my goodness. It not only has this benefit, maybe it has another benefit to it. I mean, people don't realize, but they literally are scouring the planet looking for something they can synthesize. I understand they don't want to grow it. They want to find what that compound is and see if they can synthetically make it and put it into a pill or put it into a product here and get some performance out of it. You said that if the cannabis plant was accidentally discovered today in the jungles of some remote part of the world, it would be hailed across the front pages as a wonder drug. That's a great quote, Chris, too. Yeah, that's a good call out, Paul. Yeah, yeah it's not me. Yeah, it's Raphael Machulam, right? He's the, the godfather of modern cannabis. So, but yeah, it's true. It's a pharmacological treasure trove. And we'd only <laughs> think of it as something to get us high and people either react to it or embrace it. What a great idea. Or ban it. What a horrible idea. And you're talking about a hundred other compounds in there that have unseen benefits like the ones you're tracking, rheumatoid arthritis, other sorts of things. I've seen studies on epilepsy and other sorts of things. This drug, this compound, this plant has all sorts of compounds in it that can have potentially a magical, amazing, maybe magical is not the right word, but amazing properties that we're only beginning to understand. And to piggyback off of that, I have my own biased opinions on this, but Chris, I'm curious from your perspective as one of the brands participating in this study, you know, I think I obviously, maybe not obviously, but biasly think that data and getting this type of data is the way of the future of the cannabis industry. But like Paul just said, you have these pharma drug development companies that are always looking to find these plant-based therapies, figure out how to synthesize them and create very specific medicines. You're essentially trying to do that in a natural way with these products. What does the future of this industry look like? Are we, you know, because we are obviously with this study going down a very specific path that's probably new to this audience in regards to the future of the industry. Because again, let's walk into a dispensary and get pointed to an indica sativa hybrid versus, oh, let's walk into the dispensary and get pointed to this very specific formulation because as this very specific therapy, there's obviously a big gap in those two narrative and those two experiences. And then you got pharma kind of hanging out here watching it. So I'm just curious with your background and internal company focus, where do you see things? It's a great question. I think there's definitely a bifurcation in cannabis and in industry in general, right? And we hear it all the time. It's adult use or recreational versus medicinal. Yeah. And, you know, I would say what is medicinal for a lot of people are therapeutic. You know, if people come home at the end of the day and they have a glass of wine to help them de-stress, is is that therapeutic? And in cannabis, it's much, it's much more entangled. I think the future is we you know, as we're doing, right, we're pushing or pioneering what clinical work or consumer studies looks like. So we can actually have defensible data that's been collected in a rigorous way that can be peer reviewed. So we can operate in the paradigm of what is going to be required, but we can push on it and say, yeah, actually this works really well, or this doesn't. And part of that is brands or industry participants pushing on it because we want to know different things and say what academics and the government wants to know. And we're moving so much faster. The cannabis industry is so dynamic. It's moving so fast. There really is going to be this bifurcation of what is being studied and what we're looking at because there's different impetus. And I think the future, especially in, I would say, in the private industry, outside of academia or government, is the power of cannabis is the polypharmacy. It is multi-drug components working in concert for synergistic effect. So think of Ayurvedic medicine or traditional Chinese medicine. Cannabis is the same. And so we can't apply a one-size-fits-all of Western medicine of saying one molecule, one target. Because unlike synthesized molecules or derivatized ones that have a very, very specific site of action, cannabis is nonspecific. 
it's sticky. It sticks to tons of different things and operates at different receptor sites. And so you have all this different, very challenging biological and biochemical processes happening that we don't understand. And so we're going to have to look at how we study it differently than, than how Western medicine has gone about a single molecule. And so I think it's the advent of how we push on studies and how we get people to participate. How do we use, you know, in silica or AI to really understand what's happening in black box? And then we use the empirical data as well that we have because there's so much of it. And so all of this is finding a new paradigm of how we study this complex interactions of cannabis and cannabinoids for the outcome and the, that, that we're looking for. So once again, I think we're going to end with that. Another quote that you just casually toss out. Will cannabinoids be one day listed as a new medical? You've got Indian Ayurvedic medicine, which has been practiced for thousands of years. You get Chinese traditional medicine, which has been based on similar but some different ideas. Then you have Western medicine, which is based on synthetic targeted approaches to things here. Pills and procedures, as we always say. Will this be a fourth school of medicine, cannabinoids? Fourth category. Yeah, fourth category. Where we will go into a mother's market. Yeah, give me your homeopathic approach. Give me your Indian Ayurvedic approach. Give me your Chinese traditional approach. Or yes, give me a traditional Western medicine approach. Maybe there'll be a fifth one or an additional category where cannabinoids will be a school of treatment for a variety of medicinal needs here. You're creating a new school of medicine. Wow. Okay. Pretty powerful stuff here. Thanks for doing it. It's a happy school. Everyone there is happy. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. How do people get in touch with you guys? And we'll wrap this up here. (laughs) Go start. You can kick it off. Levelexperience.com is the website where you can email support at levelexperience.com. We're on Instagram as well, level.experience. And Tyler? uh, Reliefapp.com. Relief is spelled like leaf on a tree, R E L E A F, if you catch what we did there, app.com. And then, yeah, the study, as I mentioned, if you're interested in learning more specifically about that, it's relief, R-E-L-E-A-F dot A-T backslash U-M pain. And then you can email us at contact at reliefapp.com as well. Amazing stuff here, guys. Dr. Trin, take us out. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if you guys are aware, but especially Chris, I'm in the world of clinical research. We conduct phase two, phase three, phase four clinical trials. Our clients as big pharma. But amazing what you're doing in collecting data that is much, much needed in the wild, wild west of cannabis and collecting data in in conjunction with a university, right? The University yeah. of Michigan as a partner. That says something about your organization. You're definitely not, you know, somebody who's making stuff out of the garage if you're a partner with the University of Michigan. So kudos to Level Experience. We're looking forward to, uh, to work with you from the Physician CBD Council and, and doing more stuff together. Uh, That's so great. I, yeah, thank you so much. Well, it's taken what was always fanboy kind of anecdotal stuff. This is cool. It's great. Use it. I like it. You will too. Into <laughs> a world of scientific approach, into a true medicinal category and not just, hey, this is fun. I think it's amazing. And I think we're seeing the birth of something brand new here and you guys are at the forefront, all three of you. Thank Absolutely. you. For, thank you for coming on here. Stick around for one second after I turn it off. I got one other thing I'll pass to you offline here. All right. That's it. <laughs> for our show us. today here. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Well, there you have it, folks. If that doesn't want to get you to tune in again, I don't know what will. We're at the frontier of a new day. And it starts here with conversations like this on Health Talks with Dr. Trent. Streaming live from our studio here at the University of California, Irvine's Beal Applied Innovation Center. Where innovation is part of the everyday conversation on this campus and in buildings like this across campuses all over the country, including my old alumni, the University of Michigan.